Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today is a bit of an unusual program. We'll be discussing affirmations, new thought, and beyond. My guest is Daryl Robert Schoon, who is widely known as a financial analyst, in fact, an individual who predicted the financial crash of 2008. You can visit his website, drschoon.com. He is also a minister of the Church of Universal a spiritualist church in Tucson, Arizona. Daryl is one of my oldest friends. I've known him since 1971. He is the author of Darkness in a Light Place, The Prison Years, which we'll be getting into, and he's also written a novel. Welcome, Daryl. Jeffrey, it's amazing that I'm here. <laughs> and you're here. It's amazing. And we're doing this. Yes. Yes, we are. I had a restaurant in Berkeley when you came in in 1971. You ran the Great Shanghai Steel Iron and Ironworks. Yes, an organic Chinese yes. restaurant, maybe the first. Yes. <laughs> it was ahead of its time. Yeah. That's why we went bankrupt when we, were, <laughs> when we became vegetarians. Uh -huh. Well, you, uh, most of the guests on this program are academic yes. types, yes. Uh, and we often have scholarly yes. discussions. Uh, this is going to be a little different because really, if, if anybody has come through the school of hard knocks, I think it's you. I've learned that I am only one of many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, 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 and I think that the reason why I learned that way was I'm sort of resistant as a personality, and the more resistant you tend to be, the harder are the knocks. That life itself is not malevolent, as I used to sus be suspicious, that it's really as kind as it can be, but if your resistance is high, so will the lessons. Yeah. And I've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And I and I don't regret a minute of it. Well, and, and you're here with me yes. now, and uh, you look fabulous. Thank I'm, you. I'm delighted to see you. Uh, let's start by talking about affirmations, because I know you began working with affirmations very early on in in your career. Yes, um, in 1973, oh, I'd gone to I'd gone to law school mm -hmm. years before I met you. I graduated from University of California, Davis, with a degree in political science. All right, during the 60s. And I dropped out, dropped acid, became a hippie, and really started studying uh, metaphysics, all right? And um, my friend from law school, Marshall Thurber, and we're still, we're very close today, um, he was very intense, very driven, and um, uh, and this is after my restaurant with you, where I met you, yes. a couple years later, Marshall calls me up, and he said, he wanted me to read a book called uh, The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. This is 1973, 72. And, uh, this book later was, be was the largest seller of direct mail order in the history of mail order. But nobody knew this then. It was $10 money back guarantee, which is a lot of money in 1973. It was. And Marshall wasn't lazy. He's an Aries and he was driven, but he wanted to get rich. All right. And I'm a hippie. I don't care a lot about, I'm Chinese, so I do care about money, but the hippie part doesn't care at all. All right. And, um, but I was curious because I'm always curious about what Marshall is reading. So I, I, he gives me the book and I read it. And Jeffrey, I was stunned. The closest thing that I could say to this book, and it wasn't that close, was uh, Roberto Assagioli's book, Act of Will. Mm -hmm. Brilliant book. Which is one of the foundational texts of the field of transpersonal psychology. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, see, I, did, I don't have the context, <laughs> but I knew the book. Yeah. Right? And um, Marshall's, this book was written by a guy named Jay, Joe Carbo. He was a, a, a used car dealer. And he had gone broke, and uh, somebody handed him a piece of paper, and he was absolutely in, in dire need, and he followed all the instructions on it. And he said, this is why I believe I'm now a, a millionaire. So Marshall gives me the book. I read it. Like I said, there was elements that reminded me of Asagioli's Act of Will, stunning book, but very different foundation from a used car dealer. These later on were exactly what came to be known as affirmations. 
All right, yeah. Shakti Garwan made that field very, very famous. Yes, in the, in the, in the creative in the, visualization. Creative visualization. Yeah. Joe Carbo had the way. You wrote down what you wanted, you needed, wanted, and put everything in the present tense. Put them on three part, three part five cards. Close your eyes before you went to bed, and when you woke up, and you said what those goals were in the present tense, and imagine them being real, like you already have it, like you have it. Okay, mm-hmm. and and Joe said, I don't know why you have to do it, but this worked. All right, so Marshalls did what he did, I did what I did. Okay, I never saw his list, he never saw mine. The first thing on my list was, well, I'm a hippie. All right, and I had this predilection against work because my father was a Capricorn, he always wanted to be to be productive and active. All right, so my resistance to him was to be inactive, if I could. And the truth was, I couldn't because he was my father. But I had deep-seated antipathy towards that path. So I wanted to be retired by the time I'm 30. Mm-hmm. It happened. Three years later, Marshall is living in a mansion next to the mayor of San Francisco, Diane Feinstein. He's got a Rolls Royce, a Corvette, four other cars. His children's room is in Sunset Magazine because it's got a brass pole down the center of the children's room. All right? And um, he's... Eventually, he's a multimillionaire. He's a millionaire on his way to become a multimillionaire. Uh, cover of New Age magazine for his New Age thinking. All right, um, he was one of the original people who gave five thousand dollars. He was one of four people who gave five thousand dollars to the Foundation for Inner Peace, which published uh, the Course in Miracles. All right, and he became later on very close to Bucky Fuller and Edwards Deming, the man who transformed Japan. Mm-hmm. My life was very different. All right. Um, however, at the same time Marshall was living next to Diane Feinstein, I was retired. I had a lot of money. Mm-hmm. All right. And, uh, it came to me through, I was a hippie. I was, before I met you in my restaurant, I was arrested for, when Marshall was graduating from law school, I was in jail for selling LSD. All right. And I, in fact, I took acid my first year at Hastings Law School. And, um, the next year I'm running the food concessions at the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco. Janice Joplin, Grateful Dead, I am, I've gone from being a straight, upper mobile, apparently upper mobile, <laughs> student, to being in the middle, living on Hay Street, in the middle of the whole hippie subculture. Yep. I mean, middle, the whole. No, was, I remember it was very intense in those oh, years. Oh, it was really intense. Yeah. And people look at, at all periods of great change romantically. I can tell you it's not romantic. But the Haight Ashbury in the 1970s, With, Bill Graham, the uh, rock and roll scene. We were there. Yeah. I was there. Yeah. All right. And as the, my class was graduating from law school, I'm in jail for selling LSD. All right. So I was a hippie drug dealer, inadvertently. Mm-hmm. I think it was inadvertent. Well, now you, you became quite wealthy early. You retired at the age of 30. Was that yeah. from selling drugs? Yes. Okay. Just, Marshall had his list and he wanted to get rich. I didn't say I'm going to become a successful drug dealer. Affirmations, you see the intended result. You don't put any constraints or direction on how you get there. Mm-hmm. So I basically, thinking back of it, I saw myself just that, having all this money. and You know, I, I read that. I'm retired by the time I'm 31. I'm yeah. 30. Mm-hmm. And I feel, imagine what it would feel like. Yeah. And it happened. Right. I, I mean, I'm and, there. And, and you attribute that to the use of the affirmations. Yes, I, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mar- because Marshall and I, that's the, that's the thing that we were doing differently. You both started out poor. Poor. Well, Marshall told me at the time, he said, Daryl, I'm broke. I said, Marshall, you're broken wingtip brogues. Wingtip brogues. I'm broken flip flops. There's a difference. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But so we started out from our own relative desire to get wealthy. Mm-hmm. We both got wealthy. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, really wealthy. Okay. What happened was this. I'm living on Union Street, 1976. I'm, I have everything that people think that they would have, they'd be happy. I still have my youth, which I don't have now. All right. I have a whole lot of money. I'm married. I have these two wonderful kids. The only thing I'm thinking about is what to do with my life in the day. Where do we eat? I'm trying to heal my relationship with my father, so I'm taking private tennis lessons because my father was a tennis junkie. Mm-hmm. All right? And that's what I'm doing. And so I'm, life is good. And I'm living, I'm staying in, I'm living on Union Street 
And Jeffrey, I hear these words. One day in my, in my place on Union Street, I hear the word, the voice. This isn't it. And I'm shocked. Not that I heard the voice. I'm shocked because of the implication. What do I do? Give it all up? Now, if I, and I, in retrospect, I thought, if I had been in my forties, a very successful corporate, you know, attorney, mm. and, and all of a sudden I feel very dissatisfied with my wife, my kids, my lifestyle, my many homes, my great wealth, and, and I hear these words at a very deep level, this isn't it, perhaps I would have given it all up, moved to Haight Ashbury, and started making belts and selling them on the street. But I had already been there. Yeah. And I knew that being broke and being a hippie wasn't it either. Mm-hmm. So Marcel and I at the time had been taking a seminar called the Knowing Seminar. And I told you before, it was put on by Michael Toms, mm-hmm. New Dimensions Radio, yeah. New Thought, very advanced. Michael person. is an old friend. Oh, as, as you would was, was an old friend. You know mine. many yeah, of these. Yeah, we worked together, yeah, sure. You know almost all the people I've read about. I mean, you have talked. I mean, you're amazing what you've done, all right, since you walked to my restaurant. Okay. <laughs> so... um yeah, I should just let our viewers know you're the guy who taught me how to uh, cook Chinese style. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, folks. Yeah. Right. So I hear these words. This isn't it. Well, Michael Tom's seminar was called the Knowing Seminar. This is in 76. And what you would do, this is what we learned. Marshall, Marshall and I took it together. Okay. You would, to know anything, you would quiet your mind. You go into the silence. And you'd ask your question. And you'd wait for the answer. All right? Yeah. Which is a very important thing on our topic today. Mm-hmm. Beyond affirmations, beyond thinking. Mm-hmm. You'd wait for the answer. So I did that. I closed my eyes. It was such a shock. This is it. Oh, no. You know? <laughs> there goes my karma gear. <laughs> I closed my eyes and I said, what is it that I want? And this feeling of peace that was so deep came over me. I mean, I could, I could hear like the crickets going. The image I had was I was on a, on the side of a hill and it was dark and there was a cabin on the other side of the hill with a, with a fire on in its hearth. And I knew that was my cabin and I knew I wasn't in it. So I wasn't home and I was totally at peace. And I opened my eyes and went, wow. I mean, let me tell you something. I know you're not a drug dealer, okay? The life of a drug dealer is not peaceful. The phone rings, and I'm, I had friends of mine who I think liked that edge. I imagine Jerry, I mean, Jeffrey, when I was going through it, my description of my period during that time was, I was, I felt like I was an accountant trapped in the body of a pirate. Mm-hmm. All right? It was not my druthers. Yeah. All right? Very intense. You know, fake names and all this stuff, cash, you know, like... Anyway, that's another thing. And so this feeling of peace was particularly evocative Mm -hmm. to me. So I thought, if affirmations got me all this stuff, which it did in my mind, maybe it would get me peace. So I started taking lines out of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. I remember the one I took from Jonathan Livingston Siegel. I am everywhere at once. Wong the Chinese Siegel told him that, a goal. And I go, and I, I remember writing it down, I'm going, what is this? I am everywhere at once. But it was in the cut. It was one of my cards. Mm-hmm. I am at peace. So we, I added it to my litany of affirmations. Three or four months later, Marshall, he was having his whole real estate agency do affirmations because it made him rich. He felt everybody worked was going to get make him rich. You know, it would mm-hmm. work. Affirmations work. Yeah. That was our theory. Mm-hmm. So he has everybody doing it. So I went, I used to, I had nothing to do. So I used to show up at Monday mornings when they'd have this meeting, the, 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 the company meeting, all right? And Marshall wasn't there that day. But a couple came in, you know, Mary Payne and Jim Grenovic, right? Okay? Jim they, Hickman. Oh, Jim Hickman, you're right. Jim Hickman. Who has been uh, a guest on this channel. Not so long ago, Jim Hickman. How little Another do I know. old friend of mine who is also uh, an old friend of yours. Yes. All right? Mm -hmm. So Jim and Mary walk in, and they tell us. I'm sitting there with the rest of the real estate agents. All right? Some of these agents are lawyers. They're making so much money, they never worked again in the day of their life. They gave it their law practices to be, this is how successful Marshall's company was. Mm -hmm. All right? 
So I'm with them, and and Jim and Mary walk in, and they say, uh, we know you're working with affirmations, and uh, we have an affirmation we're going to work with today. The affirmation is, I am entitled to miracles. Now, I had nothing on my list of that magnitude in terms of a my thought system. Yeah. I am entitled to miracles. So we close our eyes and imagine that. Well, I don't know what I imagined, but what I knew was this is an extraordinary affirmation. So I went up to Jim after it, and I said, where did this affirmation come from? And he said, well, it came from a book that was just published. And he hands me the book, and I open it up, and it said, Course in Miracles. This is a required course. This is a manual for peace. Only the time you take it is up to you. Free will does not mean you establish the curriculum. It merely means you choose what to take at a given time. This book does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing your blocks to your awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear. However, that which is all-encompassing has no opposite. Herein lies the peace of God. That which is real can never be threatened, and that which is unreal does not exist. I read those words, and I went, wow. He said this book was just published. Marshall told me, 20 years later, he was one of four people who underwrote the publication of the first edition of The Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. So I was right there when it came out. And I had been doing affirmations on peace for four months. Perhaps another indication of the power of of thought, affirmation, and reality, what we call reality. So I ordered the book, 1976, and I'm at home. And and, and as well, you know, the, the, there's a series of, of lessons, one lesson a day for a year. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along there, it said, one of the lessons said, um, why do you want things to be a certain way? You want things to be a certain way. Why? It says, because based on your past experience, you determine what's good and what's bad. And, and some of the things, you know, you don't want to happen again and other things you do. He says, let me tell you something. This is the, the book doesn't talk like that. The book has been iambic pentameter in a very lofty, very loving, conscious knowing place. I'm interpreting. The, the idea is that it was channeled from Jesus Christ by a, a Jewish lady who, whom I met, Helen Shuckman. Oh, you, I met Helen too. Yeah. When I, okay, Helen. She was an atheist. Yeah. And, and, and she, and she, she was she, always uncomfortable with, uh, with what they do her. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Helen told me, she said, when she started hear, hearing the voice, mm -hmm. she thought she was going through menopause. <laughs> she really, <laughs> it freaked her out. Yeah. She heard a voice. Uh -huh. And, and she tells, uh, Bill Tefford, who's head of the department, the scribe, known as the scribe. Right. They were psychologists. They were psychologists. At Columbia University. You know, Columbia Medical School. Yeah. Uh -huh. At the university. And, and Bill was the, uh, head of the department. And, 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 and he had come back and, and he had very upset, you know, because college politics are very, whatever, academic politics. Yeah. And he said, there's got to be a better way. And Helen said that when he, sh she heard him say that, which she thought was unusual for Bill, for Bill to uh -huh. say, because Bill was very intellectual, very, I love Bill. Mm -hmm. He had a great sense of humor. And uh, Helen said, when he said that, she heard these words come out of her mouth. He said, there's got to be a better way. And Helen's reaction was, well, I'll help you. If there is, I'll help you find it. And Helen heard herself say those words and thought, wow, that's not something I would say. Well, she started hearing this voice, and she called Bill because she was afraid she was going into menopause. And this is what I love, Bill's sense of humor. Bill said, when Helen told him that, he said, well, Helen, he said this. He said, Bill said, with all the courage of one who, was, who it wasn't happening to, he said, why don't you write it down, what it says? And if it's crazy, we won't tell anyone. And if it's not, we'll find out what it said. That started the Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. Right. So here I am reading one of the lessons and it said that I want things cer a certain way because based on the past, certain things are good and certain things are bad. And, I've de and it said, I've determined, he said, and then the Course says this, you believe, it said, the truth is, you are in no position to determine what's good or bad for you. Some of the things you've enjoyed the most have retarded your progress. Other things you've learned the most from that have been the most difficult. 
You have a belief, however, that unless you're in control, life is chaos. The truth is this. If you could but turn tomorrow over to He who wants your happiness, every moment would become an encounter with the Eternal. I read those words and I went, wow, that's what I want. Every moment to become an encounter with the Eternal. I had more cash than I knew what to do with. I was happily married. I had these two wonderful kids. I'm living in San Francisco. Life is outrageous. And yet, an encounter with the Eternal at every moment, that had a cachet and attraction that got my attention. Mm. And I looked at that and I thought, well, what does that mean to me? And I thought, I guess it means to turn it over tomorrow, to turn over my control. Well, what's my control mechanism? Affirmations. How did I get to that point? How was I manipulating reality so I got everything I wanted? Affirmations. And it appeared to be asking me to let go and so I could have this e eternal encounter, an encounter with the eternal at every moment. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, in more careful reading, what it said was this. And I've learned this in retrospect. If you could but turn tomorrow over to he who wants your happiness, for his, his happiness also, every moment would become an encounter with the eternal. It didn't say I could. It said if I could do it. Yeah. And in retrospect, I look back, I couldn't do it. I was too afraid. And the Course in Miracles addresses that very issue, the fear of surrender later. Mm -hmm. But in my youth and my desire to have what I didn't have, I blew past the line, if you could, and did it. Mm -hmm. I gave up every one of my affirmations, except for the Course in Miracles. And in the next year and a half, I lost every penny and went a quarter million dollars in debt. A very intense experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, at one point I looked to, to my brother-in-law, who had no idea how I made my money. What it, we were both hippie, and he uh, he had a health food store in, in Cottonwood, right near Sedona. Right, they were this country hippies, and we were the city hippies, rock and roll in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, "This, this last year and a half has been like living in a pressure cooker, and the only thing I don't want to happen." Is for, for somebody to open up the lid and look in and say, oh my God, I think we left the heat on a little too long. Then my house burned down and Benjamin got burned in the fire. Mm -hmm. Totally penniless. Having to liquidate my Chinese rug business. All right. I was now importing Chinese rugs. I, we, I, we have, it's another story. When, by the time I was, I had presidential invitations mm -hmm. in 1979 when Deng Xiaoping came to the United States. I was in Dine Feinstein's China Committee. So I would, things were happening for me. Mm -hmm. I lost everything. And on the back page, here we are living in Marin County in my wife at the time's uncle's house. No money. I have $2,000 in the bank. And she says, we got to move out of this house because her cousin was crazy. He was, he was pretty extreme. Mm. And we're driving around Marin County, the most expensive county in the country, and with the most expensive rents. I've got $2,000 in cash, only because I'm not paying rent. And we're looking, and on the back page of the Independent Journal's classified ad is a whole page ad for Joe Carbo's Lazy Man's Way to Riches. That's how the universe communicates with me. Mm -hmm. And in case I didn't get it, my wife says, don't you think we ought to do that again? <laughs> she knows I stopped it yeah and she knows what happened to us mm -hmm. and here she's here she is yep. there's the ad yep. don't you think we had it we didn't have to buy the book we went home we wrote our goals out mm -hmm. we wrote our goals the children are going to the perfect school we live in that blah 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 house you know she wrote I go to Europe Asia and Tahiti everything happened in the next year of those goals that she wrote down okay from doing whether the affirmation, all we know is we did the affirmations. Mm -hmm. Okay. You did the affirmation and you got the results. And so it's natural to assume that it's going to come a, up a causal relationship. Yes. By this, very causal. Yeah. Okay. A year later, 
I'm we're at, we're at a suite at the Hassler Hotel in Rome. Mm-hmm. All right, from I mean, really broke. You yeah. and life is good again. Okay, then I read another book. <laughs> These books, somebody should control my reading list. <laughs> I think somebody is, and it's a book that you're familiar with, Harold Percival's book, Thinking and Destiny, mm-hmm. published in 1946. I'm a deep student of metaphysics. You, I remember when I, I met you, Jeffrey, and we had a few conversations, and the thought that came to me was, wow, this man has read more than I. That was one of the, I never oh, told you. No. That was one of my thoughts. Yeah. Wow. Back in the 19, Back, early s- 1970s. Yeah. At that time, <laughs> this man has read more than I. I, I was <laughs> deeply into <laughs> metaphysics at the time and myself, yeah. yes. And that was a little thought I had about my subtitle on you that mm-hmm. I never shared with you. Okay. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I'm reading this book, Thinking in Destiny, and I get to this paragraph where he says, Your use of thought to create your reality is an inappropriate use of this power at this time. Why? Because at this time, much of what you learn comes through adversity, and you are using this power to keep these situations away from you. Hmm. Mm. My reaction, totally. Whew. I had no answer. And it seemed correct. Mm-hmm. I, you know, the Course of Miracles said, much of what you, you know, the most, the most intense periods, the most, where you most uncomfortable, you learn the most from. And this said the same thing. Yeah. At this time, much of what you learn comes to adversity. And you were using this, you were using thought affirmations, we call them, to keep these situations away from you. Mm-hmm. Ooh. So I had no answer. So the next time, my money starts going south, because it goes north and south quite often in my life. I wasn't ready to give it up that easily. Mm-hmm. I threw the e-check. And you're still dealing drugs, I presume. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I would retire intermittently. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I would come back into mm-hmm. it intermittently. So the life of a drug dealer. The life of a drug dealer. And I might just mention parenthetically for our r- r- viewers, if they really want to understand that, they should check out your novel because you've written a novel about that life. Well, so what happens? I read this and I throw the each chain whether I can do affirmations because to keep my, and it goes, no. So then I asked, I went there like that. I asked knowing, no, which is source, the knowing seminar. Can I do affirmations? And it said, no. So I sat there like a bump in the log. And a year and a half later, I get sandwiched in a sting operation for a Colombian drug dealer. All right? And I get sentenced to 10 years in prison, 1985. All right? And once I got to prison, I threw the I Ching and I said, uh, can I do affirmations? I said, sure, go ahead. Hmm. I was now where I was supposed to be. For my adversity. Well, I can say this. I want to note it with three things that happened. The first week in prison, I met Howard Hughes's banker, ex-banker, who told me a story about a CIA scam, a 500, White House CIA scam of 500 million, which explained why he was in prison. And he told it to me under extenuating circumstances, and I was the only one who told, which is the reason why we reconnected just, I just might mention parenthetically, it dawned on me when I read your material about this, that, uh, because many of our viewers are really into conspiracy theories. Oh, really? That, that it would be a good topic, and, and you were right in the middle oh. of, of conspiracy <laughs> theories there in prison, oh. actually. actually he, this banker tells me a story I have no reference for, I had never heard about, and a year, as it's telling me, I'm reading confirmation of it in the LA Times. That they had discovered five hundred million dollars of U.S. Saudi money, which Norman had told me he solicited from the Saudi royal family. Nobody knew about. It. There in the L.A. Times, I'm reading at Lompo, California, the L.A. Times story that they had dis- the money had been discovered commingled with funds from Iran Contra in the bank account of an of Israeli Swiss banker, Bruce Rapoport. All right, who twenty years later I find out bank whose Bank of New York is connected to nine eleven. Well, in any case, we're, we're, we're going to deal with that in a separate Separate. discussion. So that happens the first week. What happens later is I begin meditating seriously. Mm. Seriously. 
and and I got to a state of oneness. Which I, is I, it was a, a great way to spend your time if you have to be in a penitentiary. My higher self knew that was the only way it was going to get me to do that. It knew that to get to 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 for me to meditate with a requisite amount of intent and time, I was going to be needed to be. That's why it said. I was using affirmations to keep away those situations that I needed for my own advancement. Mm-hmm. Prison was, I call prison my monastery for those not inclined to sign up of their own free will. Mm-hmm. Okay? And it was. Well, another, the third thing that happened, Jeffrey, was this, which led, led to us meeting 20 years later. The last year I'm in prison, in September 1991, I'm now at uh, Terminal Island in Long Beach. Rolls of guard wire, gun towers, okay. which I found a lot more better than Lompoc, the which was the country club the country prison, club. prison. So I preferred the the higher level, mm-hmm. and not because of its more constraint, but for other reasons we can talk about later. And I'm there six months from my release date, and I hear another set of words. These words just came to me out of the blue. In times of expansion, it is to the hair the prize goes. Quick, risk-taking, and bold, his qualities are exactly suited to the times. In times of contraction, however, the tortoise is favored. Quick only to retract his vulnerable head and neck, the slow and sure is preferable to the quick and easy. There There comes a time, however, when neither the hare nor the tortoise is the victor. This is the time of the vulture. The vulture does not feed upon the stored up wealth of the bear or the bear or the patches of the bull, which lie buried deep beneath the rubble of economic collapse. The vulture instead feeds upon the blind denial and ignorance of the ostrich. The time of the vulture is at hand. Now, this is like a download that came to you. Just came to me. Yeah. I am not. Tell me about the economic situation to know it. No. Mm -hmm. It just comes to me. You didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for it. And I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. Just like I wrote down at the beginning of my novel, which you wrote, you read years later, five years later. Mm -hmm. I write it down and I look at these words and go, what is this? There was no context. I mean, even though I was in prison, I knew we weren't in the middle of an economic collapse. All right? No sign of this at all. This is the early 90s. 91. Yeah. September of 91. I get out in, in February of 92. I'm living in San Francisco. And that decade, I began all over. I began, on for reasons unknown to me, I began studying the causes of the Great Depression. What happened to the money? Very interesting question. What caused it? I mean, I become fascinated with it. I turned to Martha at this time. I said, I'm an ex-hippie. I said, why am I reading about this? All right? Later on, what happens, I become, I now understand it. I understand it from a very deep level. I mean, I understand money. I understand gold. I understand the economic collapse. To leave, and, and, and what happens is, is that because of this, my friend Marshall puts together a group of people, all right, uh, in, in 2004, called the Positive Deviant Network. Which, which Marshall's, he ta- he brought together around 60 people. It was a private network. $5,000 a year dues. You'd meet four times a year. And they were very, they were very high powered people. Mm-hmm. And Marshall said, out of the box thinkers who had achieved success. And he asked Martha and I to join. All right. He said we were among the most deviant people he knew. Marshall believed that positive deviants held the answers in times of crises, of immense change. Mm. That when change happened, it was those at the fringes that had the answers. Those at the center didn't understand the change at all. They saw the change as a threat. Those at the fringes saw the change because they weren't at the center. Now, now Marshall saw said that everybody at the fringe doesn't have the answer. But those who do have the answer are at the fringe when the crisis starts. All right? And eventually they move towards the center. And, and really, when the paradigm shifts, their thoughts are the basis of the new paradigm. So Marshall puts this together in 2004 because he wants to bring these thinkers, that these crazy, crazy people, 
<laughs> including Marshall, bring together in a network because Marshall believed that everything spread through networks. Mm -hmm. So Marshall puts this together, invites Martha and I to come. One of the people in the network was a retired bond trader, John Body. I had no idea who John was. John's very low key, very unassuming. All right. And I meet him with this group. We met four times a year. Mm -hmm. Marshall says, Daryl, John is very worried about the economy. Well, he wasn't worried like I was by that time. I had worked myself up into a head of steam yeah. about this collapse. Mm -hmm. I had become obsessed with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm driving around in the, in there, you know, thinking this place is going to be in shambles. All right. Because once you hear those words, once you really see the, the, the water on which we're walking of credit and debt, you, you know, it can give away at every moment. Well, you know, we're going to talk uh, about that later. About that later. But what I would like to talk about was while you were in prison, you encountered a seven-volume set of uh, books books dealing with the use of affirmation and thought. And thought. It was a. This is what I was really in prison for. One of them. I was in prison for a lot of things. There was a series of channel books called Right Use of Will. Okay. And they were never registered with the Library of Congress. All right? Mm -hmm. The books said, just like the Course of Miracles said it was from Jesus, these books said they were from Jesus' dad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or grandfather, mm -hmm. as the Indians would say. Grandfather spirit. Mm -hmm. All right? And from source. And it said that most do not believe they can hear from me directly, it directly. But he said, this is not true. We can. He said, you're all part of me. You can hear from me if you're receptive. All right. So these books said, not only they were never registered with the Library of Congress, they said, do not tell other people about these books unless you have a strong intuitive feeling that it can help them. All right. So this book gets sent to me my first year in prison. And what it did, Jeff, it impacted me profoundly because in the lexicon of reality and how we think, I was very polarized to being left brain, what we call left brain. Mm -hmm. I'm Chinese, all right? And most people, you know, my joke with emotions in Chinese is, you know, there's not even a character in the Chinese word for emotions. People, <laughs> and that's my joke. Yeah. But the Chinese are notorious for having that area tapped down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the get go. Adding on to that, I'm male. And you know what women say about men and feeling? Okay? Mm -hmm. Highly polarized mm -hmm. to that polarity. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I'm an Aquarian. An air sign. Highly polarized to that reality. Yeah. So this book starts talking about feeling. It said the dynamic of, of everything is the interplay of spirit and will. The two polarities. Spirit awareness. And he said, it's how spirit has treating, treated its polarity feeling that has led to the problems that we have today. The dynamic of the will polarity. It says the will, it calls the will polarity. Spirit and will. It says the will polarity is the fem, what you call the feminine. The yin. And it manifests to you as feeling. And what spirits have done is they denied their feelings. Because the feelings are so, full of these uncontrollable terror, rage, anger, that we just, we put a lock on it. Mm -hmm. All right? And it said, because of this, you're not learning and you're not moving. Because you've frozen one of the one of the conduits of, of life itself, one of the streams. And then it goes this. This is where it gets me. I told you this story last night. So there I am, reading this book. I love metaphysics. All right? I'm reading this book. And it said, if you are in a place not to your liking or in a position, perhaps you should ask yourself why. Well, I didn't have to go, you know, I, I just hate my boss, you know, or I just don't get along with people. I'm in prison, starting a 10-year prison sentence. The answer, the question was rhetorical, and so was the answer. Mm -hmm. Why am I here? So I closed my eyes and the book, like the Knowing Seminar, and I said, why am I here? The answer was immediate. You have feelings of powerlessness. Well, to me, it was true. 
My father's a Capricorn. He's an engineer. He raised us according to the book, very strict playbook about what we should do, what we shouldn't do. <clears throat> and I had no power. I am very politically aware. I'm reading books on power politics in high school, and I come out into this zeitgeist, this culture, and I realize I have no power. Okay? The powers that be were trying to send my ass to Vietnam. All right, We're smoking dope. They criminalize us. Every, I mean, I have no power. I look at the political scene, and I and intuitively I realize the Republicans are the center of power, and the Democrats have no value in protecting me against these people. All right? So I totally disaffected from the power and the power structure. And I told you this morning, I said, I majored in political science, and I'm really aware of what's happening politically. All right? And I've never registered to vote in a political in a presidential nomination. Then they took so when they took my right away, I'd already given it up. Mm -hmm. All right? Because to me, pulling on that on uh, going in a, in doing that Chad was like pulling on a slot machine. Mm -hmm. Good fucking luck. I know who built the casino. And I know why they've got you all in there going, ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. That's my cynical view of the political process. Mm-hmm. So there I am, and it says, you have feelings of powerless. I do. Wow. Well, if I could go, I got, if I got, if, if I was a different person, I could have justified my feelings, which is what I just did to you. Yes. But at that time, I didn't. Because the implications were, because I was not willing to feel my feelings, I had evoked a reality where I was powerless totally in the exterior reality. Mm -hmm. Because I was, I had these feelings mm -hmm. that I was refusing to feel, I had triggered a phenomenon in my life where I was truly powerless. Your unconscious feeling. My unconscious feeling. Yeah. That I was trying to stay away from. Mm -hmm. They were running the show. They were running the show. And so in 1985, 86, when I'm reading this, I thought, wow. If this is the way things work, it's a new idea to me. <laughs> this idea, you know. If this is the way things work, I better start feeling my feelings. The book said, you believe, as spirits, that your feelings are an exterior part of your reality. So I want to tell you something. He says, your feelings are your reactions to your reality. They are your feelings. So your feeling in a certain situation is your reaction. And by, de by denying and by your refusing to feel those feelings, terror, powerlessness, helplessness, fear, loneliness, separation, you are killing those feelings because you are light. You are light. And light is life. And when you withhold the light from a part of yourself, which is your feelings, your feelings start to atrophy and die. And as their paroxysms are getting closer, they start freaking out and bringing these realities to your attention, hoping to get your attention, mm -hmm. hoping to get your light to come to them. They don't even know this. They're unconscious. They're in the dark. They're in the dark, literally. And you are the light, literally. And by withholding your attention and refusing to feel these feelings, you are withholding life from a part of yourself, which are your feelings. And that's why you are dying. It's a very powerful insight. <laughs> that's what I was there for, for the insight. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I know, Jeffrey, that if I was on the outside in my estate in Marin County, I feed up reading this metaphysical book because I I'm interested in metaphysics yeah. and I read those words they would have had a different effect on me mm -hmm. but it sort of put me in its sights you know okay yeah. Daryl could you raise your chin a little more <laughs> yeah your, uh, your honor <laughs> they had to get me where I would get it mm -hmm. and they got my attention yeah seriously seriously so in 1986. I began to be open to my feelings in a way that I never had before. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's as our talk about affirmations and thoughts. Okay? Is that I realized that thoughts, as powerful as they are, and they truly are powerful, because I've experienced the power of thoughts at a level that most people haven't. 
I mean, I've gone from having no money to suites in Paris and, in, you know, and then stopping them and going back down and having no money. Yeah. You know, well, I wonder what happens if you touch this. Mm-hmm. Okay? <laughs> it makes me afraid to touch anything. Yeah. All right? Which leads me to where I am now. One of my jokes about myself and how I live life is that because of my personality, when I wanted to go somewhere, I, I put my foot on the gas pedal because I want to get there fast. Mm-hmm. But because of my fears about life, I have the other foot on the, on the brake <laughs> just as deeply now. <laughs> and I'm spinning around going like this. Mm-hmm. All right. Jeffrey. I'm sure you're not the only one. <laughs> okay. I have come to the conclusion that the best way for me to get what I want is to go into neutral. Mm-hmm. To be in the moment. And I'm rereading after all these years, because partly because of this conversation we're having today, Harold Percival's Thinking and Destiny. Mm-hmm. I'm not yet through it. It's a thousand pages. I am on page 76. I know exactly <laughs> where I am. And I'm reading it very carefully. Mm-hmm. And he talks about thought, thinking and destiny. And he talks about it in a way that I've never run into people talking about thought. All right? And what he says is this. When you think with attachment, you create a destiny and a thing is going to happen to you. All right? And, and it, and it does. I mean, even quantum mechanics know the power of our thought and observation on anything changes it. Mm. Changes it! I mean, how can this be? It doesn't matter. It is. So I'm reading Harold Percival in a way I've never read before. Now, you realize this is a book I read in 1980, 1983 that scared the bejesus out of me and had me stop doing affirmations, and I ended up with a 10-year, traumatic 10-year prison sentence, okay, which changed my life for the better. Mm-hmm. I just paid a high tuition. But as we all know, the best schools have the highest tuition, <laughs> allegedly. Okay. So there I am, back to reading this book because I knew I was going to be talking to you. I have these thoughts you brought up. I'm thinking about things I haven't thought about in years. And I'm reading Mr. Percival's book, Harold Percival's book on thinking. And, and it, it coincides with much of my other thought about thought. All right. Because we are conscious beings. We are light. And thought is creative. I mean, it sets, we are in here and now in motion. You've thought, according to Harold, you've thought this. Mm -hmm. This didn't come from out of the blue. The fact that you live in Albuquerque and we're now in your studio and you came in my restaurant in 1971 did not have, it comes from out of the blue, but the blue, but where it comes from is the process called the power of thought, which is the subject of our conversation. Mm -hmm. But the subject of our conversation is and beyond, Mm -hmm. which is, going to neutral. Yeah. Okay? In the state of neutrality, or what Ram Dass or Sri Ramana Maharshi called now, <laughs> for want of a better word, in the moment is the potentiality for everything. I've now gone from the idea that I'm powerlessness, which was an observation I made in my life mm-hmm. after I was born. No power. To the belief, to the theory that I am all powerful, but not the I that I identify as Daryl Shun, the I that I am a part of. Okay? If thine I be single, I. We always interpret it if you only look at one thing, which it has a meaning there. If thine I be single. But there's another meaning. If thine I be single. If thy I-ness, if that Identity, if the unity of self reunify is unity again, then all things shall. That's that's where it is. In that, in that apparent st- apparent state of non-action, all action flows from. And the ego goes, "Well, nothing will happen then if you're in non-action." Of course, the ego would say that. Of course, the dissociated self would take that position and scare you, try and. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Because it is afraid that if you go there, it will not exist. Mm. But it is not true. Many things the ego thinks aren't true. The ego will exist as your 
as your present conscious focal point in creation. You're not going to forget how to tie your shoes. No. And if you do, it's not because of <laughs> enlightenment. It's because you you demand it. You've got <laughs> Alzheimer's. All right? Not because you've forgotten to tie your shoes. Not because you're enlightened. Yeah. Not because you're enlightened. So, so this is where it has led me at this moment in 2019, mm-hmm. talking with you about thought. Yeah. And, 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 and curiously enough, the title of your program has always been Thinking Aloud. And it, it is. I used to be very cynical about thinking. All right, my, I used to play. I, I, I had these cats. Right? And I would get down on my knees, and I had a very intelligent cat. And I said, Bruno, I know you're thinking about this, and it's not good. <laughs> to my cat! <laughs> right? This is not good because of what I saw it would lead to. Mm. It could lead to. All right. So being who I am, I made a blanket stomach because I'm in judgment. My ego, good or bad. Mm. I now gone. This is bad. Mm-hmm. All right. Because I know the power of thought. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really know the power of thought. And I'd say it's bad. It's not good. It's neither good nor bad. It is. It's part of the gestalt of oneness. It's part of the zeitgeist of light and enlightenment. It is part of who we are. It is a gift from the universe itself. A creative gift. But because we are dissociated in the present state from our source, I call this EDS. We are all suffering from EDS, egoic dissociative syndrome. Oh. Okay? Mm-hmm. And when you are dissociated from your, from your source, it's an unreal state. But things become real that were not real before. Mm-hmm. Fear, loss, terror. Loneliness as a result of dissociating. The way back to oneness is the way back through those feelings. We have felt, and it's understandable, the further away you get from those negative feelings, the better off you're going to feel. That's not true. You, the opposite is true. You have to go back. You have to go back and feel. You have to go back through everything you denied, through all the loss from the very beginning. The state of dissociation, even though it's illusory, created a, a real reaction in us be, as sentient beings in our emotional bodies. So the way back, Jeffrey, is not away from it. It's towards it. Yep. We are like the moth going back to the light that turns into the phoenix. Mm. Well, Daryl, I know we're going to have many more conversations while you're here in Albuquerque. And uh, I realize we could keep going for a long time just just on on this one, but maybe this is a good time to pause. You, I know our viewers have a great deal to digest, and uh, we we're going to talk about many things while okay. you're here. We're going to talk about money. Okay. We're going to talk about conspiracy <laughs> okay. theory, and we're also going to talk about spirit. Yes, yes, my my deepest love. All right, my mm-hmm. deepest love. I used to think of anything, my ego thought, of anything. I had one of my thoughts in, in my book, Light in the Dark Place, was that believing I was temporal led to the fear of the eternal. Mm. Now that I know I'm eternal, I have no fear of the temporal. And it used to scare the shit out of me, Jeffrey, because of what would happen to me. You know, I mean, I remember being on a, you know, those, those, uh, those, uh, um, Things in the airports, the people movers. Yeah. Okay. And it's early morning. I'm taking a flight. And I've got a briefcase filled with cash. Filled with cash. No one's... It's early morning. I'm on that thing. And my briefcase opened. All the cash. <laughs> this is why I, this is why I, I a classic see a Hollywood uh, should have been there <laughs> they would have seen it and I get on my knees and I look around no one's there oh and I put all the cash back in and I clip it up and I continue my journey now that encapsulates my life these unreal situations happening my greatest fear not actualized. Daryl Schoon, thank you so much for being with me. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having me be here, Dr. Mishlove. <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Thank you.